877-627-6137. We'll reach out to you this week to help you get connected with all of the exciting things happening here at the Met. In the lobby at our guest services counter, we also have a welcome gift just for you. Stop by for your special gift and to meet one of our pastors. Once again, we are so glad you decided to join us. Now, enjoy the rest of your service. The dark tried to hide you and steal you away. And death tried to keep you inside of the grave. The enemy fought you, he tried, but he lost. You cannot be stopped. Who could carry 
that kind of way It was my turn Till I met Great to see you here on a Sunday morning. I want to welcome all of you that are watching online as well. Why don't you go ahead and put a big old smile on your face, greet the people around you, shake their hand, introduce yourself, say good morning, and you keep on standing and singing with us. I've seen your grace from the I felt you there in the valley below. I see your love and your mercy guiding me home. I know you're in every season. I feel your hand bringing peace and control. Jesus, your love.
The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Sorrow may come in the darkest night. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. The cross has the final word. Evil may put up its strongest fight. The cross has the final word.
You spoke to the dark, fleshed out the wonder of night. And as you speak, a hundred billion galaxies are born. In the vapor of your breath, the planets form.
But what measure could amount to your desires? You're the one who never leaves the one behind. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning with grateful hearts because we know that we're always on your mind. You're always looking out for us and that you want the best for us. That you see what we're going through, you see what we're dealing with, you see the good, the bad, and you love us anyway. You have such a great love for us. It was a love that sent your son. It was a love that had him take all of our sin and shame upon himself. It was a love that had him go to the cross for us and die for us, be buried for us. And on the third day, he rose again for us. It's a love like we can't comprehend. It's unconditional. And we thank you for that, God. We thank you for that great love that just wraps around us, being whatever we need, whenever we need it. And that's why, God, we wanna live lives that glorify you because of what you've done for us. So open up our hearts and minds this morning. Open up our hearts this morning and receive the words that you have for us, words that give us a greater understanding of who you are and who you can be in our lives, words that give us courage, words that give us comfort, words that give us strength. Because God, we want you to change us this morning. We want you to change us. We want to leave this place with a better understanding that we can walk in your ways because you are there with us. That we can trust you through all that we face because you are always with us. So speak to us this morning, God. And now as we continue to worship you through the giving of our tithes and offerings. God, we just pray that you see our hearts and you see that we're joyful givers and we give back in love and obedience to you. And we ask that your hand is on this offering. You would bless it for us as a church so that we can continue to do more and more ministry, that we can get outside of these walls, we can reach people who don't know you and we can shine your light because that's what it's all about is pointing people to you, God. And that's what we wanna do. We love and praise you and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Right now, our ushers are getting ready to come forward to receive this morning's tithes and offerings. But first, we want you to take a look at what's happening here at the Met. Hi, my name is Amber, and this is your Met Five. Our food pantry is hitting the road on June 28th in an effort to make access to free food more readily available for our local senior citizens in need, we've started this Senior Share Mobile Food Pantry program. Every fourth Friday of the month, you can volunteer to serve at our mobile food pantry located at two low-income senior citizen apartments in the area. For more information, email outreach at metchurch.com. Looking for a good date night idea? On July 19th at 7 p.m., the Met is hosting Improv Night. Join us and a cast of comedians from the Dallas Comedy House who will spontaneously create a hilarious show revolving all around relationships. Tickets are $15 a person and we even have discounts for groups who want to purchase a table. The reservation deadline for childcare and the event will be July 14th. We've also got another event just for couples coming up in August. Bring your significant other for our blueprint marriage event with a relationship expert, Dr. Kood. Discover qualities that create successful marriages now and in the future. Dr. Kood has a PhD in marriage and family therapy and has been helping marriages thrive for over 29 years. Registration is open now and spots are limited, so reserve yours today. Are you new to the Met and want to learn more about us? Or have you been attending for a while and are ready to move from the rows into circles by getting connected into the life of the church? Then Guest Lunch is just for you. At Guest Lunch, we'll provide you an overview of our church, our beliefs, and the vision that God has given us for ministry. Following the 11 o'clock service on July 7th, we'll be providing lunch to all of our guests and we'll even have childcare available with advanced registration. We look forward to meeting you. 
Met Youth. Our next Summer Style event will be a game night hosted right here at the church on July 10th from 7 to 9 p.m. We'll have free food, fun games, and a dodgeball tournament with prizes for the winners. That week, our theme will be sports, so be sure to represent by wearing your favorite sports team attire. For all the details on any of the events listed, visit metchurch.com slash met5. Here you'll find information and links to register. And of course, you can always visit the information counter in the lobby. Thanks for watching. I'm Amber, and this was your Met 5. I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you for your continued prayers for me and Shannon and Billy and our families as we uh, continue to kind of make these daily adjustments to our, our new normal. And we're so grateful for all of you, for your faithful support to the church, through your giving and serving, to your inviting of friends, uh, to your attendance this weekend. It means so much to our family. And I want to thank you again uh, for all that, so much more. And this weekend, I'm really excited to introduce to you a friend of mine that many of you, if not most of you, already know. Uh, he spoke at Cindy's service here a few days ago. 
Uh, he and I have been friends since high school. I think we met at 16 years old, played football together. We double dated our wives together. They were there for the birth of both of our kids. We were there for the birth of both of their kids. We served in ministry together when God led them to Grand Junction to start the church. We supported them in that effort. When God led us to South Lake to start the Met, they supported us in that effort. So we partnered in ministry together for a long time. We've spoken for one another on many occasions. And I just felt it so uh, uh, important to me and our family and, and to you as a church family that you hear him this weekend. And so I'm so glad that uh, my buddy, Dan Hooper, pastor is the founding pastor of the Fellowship Church of Grand Junction, Colorado could be here this weekend. So I really want you guys to give him a great, great welcome. Will you uh, welcome my buddy, uh, Dr. Dan Hooper? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you guys, you guys have been so nice to me. It's clapping like that. I don't get that at home. I really don't. Thank you for that. I appreciate that very much. You know, your pastor is a wonderful pastor. You know him as a great leader, and you know him as a gifted communicator of God's word. But he's a really good man. He's the real deal. I had breakfast with him yesterday morning, Cracker Barrel Restaurant, Denton, Texas. <laughs> and after we got through eating, he said to me, he said, Hooper, listen, man, I want you to treat the people of the Met like you would your own. He said, I want you to act like you're at home and so he gave me permission to act like I was at home, but I want your permission. Can I act like that we've just known each other forever and we really trust each other as I talk to you all today? Can I do that? Okay. So let me, let me, it'll be fun. It'll be more fun that way. So anyway, I was asked to come and speak for a group of men in a venue that was just north of Denver, Colorado. And I was assigned the topic, how to win at work without losing at love. Talk to these guys about how to have a great marriage relationship, but be a great provider for them as well, to not just have an income, but maybe several income streams coming to the house, how to balance all that thing out and everything and keep the marriage just going really good. So I was really excited about it. The moderator stood up and introduced me. And as he did, the guy started clapping, and I grabbed the microphone, and I said, I have been married for over 40 years. This impressed those guys because most of them were in their 20s and 30s, and they hadn't been on the planet for 40 years. They jumped up, they started clapping, and just as the applause started to dissipate, I said, to seven different women. <laughs> you should have seen them try to stop their applause in midair. They didn't even know what to do with their hands. Man, it created an awkward moment, but you know, I thought it was funny. But after a few minutes, I cleared the whole thing up, let them know I've been married to my high school sweetheart, you know, for 42 years and all that kind of stuff. We laughed, we talked about the things that we do as husbands that aggravate and frustrate and irritate our wives. We talked about what you women do that aggravate, irritate, and completely confuse us as husbands. And after it was over, after we laughed a lot, after we told a bunch of stories, one of the guys, or two of the guys came to me and one of them said to me, they said, Hooper, I'll bet back when you were in high school, you were the class clown in your high school. And I said, no, sir, I was not the class clown in our high school. The class clown in our high school was the guy that ran through the cafeteria wearing nothing but a football helmet and a pair of very short 1970 gym shorts. That was the class clown. I was not that guy. I was, however, the guy who talked that guy into doing it. I was that guy. So let me tell you what my assignment is this weekend. I want to see if you'll let me talk you into something. I want to see if you will let me talk you into living the best life that you could possibly live. That regardless of your age, regardless of your season, regardless of the stage that you are in right now, that from this moment forward, no matter what has happened to you in your past, this day forward, you will begin to live the very best life you can possibly live with the life that you have left. That's my assignment. Because here's the reality check. Take a look at it on the side screen. The average life expectancy for a woman on this planet today, worldwide, is 72 years and two months. The average life expectancy for a person 
a man on the planet today worldwide. 68 years and four months. Now, why the gap? Why is there such a difference? Well, I think it's obvious that living with you women is killing us. <laughs> but that brings the average down. Look at it, to the average worldwide life expectancy, 70 years and too much. Now, that does not mean that you get close to 70 or you're over 70, you know, your, your days are numbered. No, this is just a thing that God was trying to talk to us about, and he sets up a standard for it in his word. But do you know what the average life expectancy was on this planet with men and women prior to the flood? Believe this? 857 years. People lived an average of 857 years, and then God changed it. And in Psalms chapter 90, verse 10, he says this, our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures. So if you're tough enough, you can make it to 80. So everybody that's over 70 deserves our respect because those are some tough motor scooters right there. But the Bible says we're going to get 70 years, 80 if you're tough enough. I play golf regularly with a guy who is 83 years of age, and I have never beat him one time on the golf course. My mom lived to be 88 years of age before she went to heaven. When she was 85, 86 years of age, she used to complain about, well, it hurts. I don't want to go to the grocery store. My back hurts. This, that. And I said, Mom, Betty White is still working. And she's like 140-something. <laughs> so you can still go on after 70, 80, and you should. But do you know how old David was when he died, King David in the Old Testament? 70. Do you know how old his son was when he died, Solomon? 80. Then the Bible tells us this in Psalms chapter 90, verse 12. Teach us to realize, the Bible said, take a look, the brevity of life. God wants you and I to understand this, that life is going to be short and it's going to go by quickly. But don't be confused about this. In our unsaved nature, we think that we are in the land of the living and we are somewhat apprehensive to go to the land of the dying. But in reality, dear brother and sister in Christ, we are in the land of the dying, and we are going to the land of the living. Whoa, that was good right there, Hooper. I, I tell you, I, come on, man, right there, I give it. <laughs> God wants us in this very short life to live it to the full. He said this, he said, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that you might have and live the abundant life, the blessed life. Jesus himself even said in this life, you're going to have trouble. But then he said, but be of what? Good cheer. Good cheer. Do you know what those two words translate in the Bible? They translate down to being filled with happiness, being filled with joy, being filled with optimism, and to be confident. Jesus said, in the middle of the trouble that is going to hit your life, I still want you to be happy, joy-filled, optimistic, and confident. Now, there are many ways that the enemy who comes to kill, steal, and destroy your happiness, your marriage, your income, your life, your, your, your joy, there are many ways and many weapons he has in his arsenal in order to be able to come against you and I. One of those weapons is false perception. It's what I was talking to those guys about uh, up in Denver uh, that we sometimes have a false understanding when it comes to relationships, and it's a common one that we somehow can figure out why women can aggravate husbands, why women confuse us. And, and, and women think they can figure out and fix. That's what you think. You think you can fix a man and keep him from frustrating and aggravating and agitating you for the rest of your life. There have been lots of volumes written on this topic. There's an incredible amount of data, money that has been spent for men to be able to understand women, women to be able to understand men. I am going to give you this morning in one visual illustration that which will help you to understand why husbands aggravate and frustrate women and why women confuse their husbands, okay? But I need your help. I need your help, okay? Now, I want to ask all the women in this section and in this section, and in this section right here, to get your purses and hold them above your head. I need the visual. Come on. So get your purses, ladies, and just hold them up. Hold them up. Hold them up as high as you can. Right, everybody else in the room, yeah, yeah. Everybody else in the room, look, look at, woo! Look at, look at that. Okay, okay, great. You can put them down. May I? 
may I borrow your purse just for a second? <laughs> okay, listen, I will not look in it. I will not open it. I promise you, don't freak out. Okay, really, all the rest of you women are going, oh, thank God he didn't grab my purse. <laughs> this, I have been married to my wife now for 42 years. I have only gone into her purse three times. All three times were permission. And two of them was for chapstick and one was for gum. And, and, and she, she, I'd say, you got any chap? Honey, where's chapstick? She said, it's in my purse, inside, left side. Left side? Is this left side? Is this left side? Is this left side? I don't know, I don't know no left side of a purse. I finally still have to take her a purse. And, but, but every time I ask my wife, honey, you got an extra 20 or a 50? Bring me my purse, right? <laughs> Like, what's up with that? I can go in for chapstick or gum, but I can't go in for money because she don't want me to know how much money she's got in that purse. This is a woman. There's a lot of stuff in here. There's a lot of compartments. There's things here. There's things there. There's things here. There's things there. There are things here. We don't know what's in there. Nobody does. But this is a woman. This is a man. <laughs> this is it. Driver's license, a couple of credit cards, and a little allowance money that I think came out of her purse. <laughs> I, I don't even know. I, it just appears. I don't even know how it gets there. But there it is, right there. Now, let me ask you. This isn't your only purse, is it? No, no, you got, this isn't your only purse. You got lots of purses. You got little purses. You got big purses. You got purses to go over your shoulder. You got purses you clutch underneath your arm. You got purses of all different colors. You got summer purses, spring purses, fall purses. <laughs> lots of purses. They match your shoes, person to match your shoes, person to match your outfits. Lots of purses, all kinds of purses, all sizes of purses. And the second that we might be able to figure out this, you put this in the closet and bring something entirely different out. <laughs> How many wallets does a man have? <laughs> one. And we will hang on to this one wallet until it completely disintegrates in our pocket or until some good woman in our life goes out and buys us a new one. And you women have names for your purses. Coach. <laughs> Guess. And some Louis guy, you, you get him after, I don't know. Uh, you know what I call this? Black. <laughs> That's it. Now, uh, I just, I wanna go ahead and, and confess, okay, just for a second, I, just, I, wanna, I wanna come clean. This is just a prop. There's just paper in there, right? Right? There, it's not really her purse. Uh, I, 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 this is my purse. <laughs> I'm coming clean. I'm having breakfast with Bill yesterday morning, and, and I was worried about the fact that, you know, even though you, you, we may get along, you women still don't know me that well. Now, back at my place, I could simply say, hey, hey, you know, I'm like a big brother to them, and they're like sisters to me. The women, you know, after 30 years, and I could say to any woman in our church, hey, hey, I won't look in your purse or anything like that, but can I borrow it a minute? And they hand it right to me. They trust me. I got to worried about the fact that maybe you wouldn't because you didn't know me that well And when it comes to your purse. And so I thought, oh, no, if I do this illustration and I pick out a really big purse in the crowd and then you like freak out and freeze and won't give me your purse, I thought that's just going to be so awkward. So I thought to keep that from happening, yesterday I'm with Bill and he says, hey man, what are you gonna do today? And I said, well, I need to go to Walmart and buy a purse. <laughs> he said, Dan, there's only about two people on the planet that you should say that to, you know, that you're safe. And so he didn't help me at all. So anyway, I go to Walmart and you men know what I'm talking about. You ever gone to Walmart on a Saturday morning and picked yourself out a purse? Anybody, anybody, <laughs> anybody? I'm all alone on that? Okay, I'll carry it. <laughs> So I thought I need help, so I call my wife, my sweet wife. I love her. Best friend since high school, still best friends. And so I tell her, she says, I said, honey, I need your help. She said, what with? I said, well, I'm heading into Walmart to buy a purse. She goes, aw, that's what every wife wants to hear her husband say. <laughs> she thinks that sarcasm is a spiritual gift. 
So I say, you know, I don't want to ask one of these people that work in here on a Saturday morning, you know, I walk up to them and say, hey, where are your lady's purses? I get you weird. So she, so she tell, where are the purses at? She, she tells me all that and everything. And then she blows up my phone with gifts after that. All of them sarcastic, a little bit funny. Some of them not even appropriate. <laughs> so I get it, take it to the hotel. I bring it up here. We do all this thing. Listen. What I'm trying to tell you is that there is, and by the way, so I, I just want you to know that I have brought you this good illustration at my great personal humiliation. So you are welcome. You are welcome for that. But here's what I want you to get. When it comes to your husbands frustrating, aggravating, and irritating you, are you ready for this? Are you ready? Here it comes, here it comes. They will never stop. For the rest of your life, it's going to be there. And men, when it comes to your women agitating you and frustrating you and completely confusing you, they will never stop. That will happen for the rest of your life. You cannot fix that. Women, you're saying, well, I just wish my husband would speak to me on a deeper emotional level. He just needs to go deeper emotionally with me. Okay, okay. Let me help you with that. That's as deep as we get. <laughs> the enemy is going to come against your mind when it comes to false perceptions when it has to do with relationships. Because if he can keep you working on something and fighting about something and making a big deal out of a no deal, then all of a sudden you're spending your life trying to fix something that you cannot and you never will fix. Now, there's another area where the enemy comes against us. It's in the area of rejection. Take a look with me, if you would, on the side screen. It's 1 Samuel chapter 16. And verse 10 says this. Jesse had seven of his sons, Pastor. But here's the players. We got Jesse. He's the father of seven sons, two daughters. His eighth son was, was David, by the way. We have Samuel, who was the prophet in that day. And here we go in the verse. Jesse had seven sons passed before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. Samuel's there to look for the next king that would replace Saul. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? And he said, they're still the youngest. David, he's out there in the field. He's tending the sheep. Well, wait a minute, Jesse. You couldn't even call for him? The next king's going to be picked out of your household? I'd make sure all my sons were there and any neighborhood kids that looked like me would be in that house. But you leave David out? You didn't think enough about him to even call him in for the parade? And then Samuel says this. Samuel says, go get him, send for him, look at it. We will not sit down until he arrives. There is an infection from rejection that if not dealt with properly, that all of us have dealt with in our lives, to keep you on the hamster wheel for the rest of your life. For there is an epidemic that is invading the environment of everyone who is in this very special place right now. And if people could reject a perfect Jesus, it is unrealistic and it is illogical for you to think that people will not reject you. Everybody, and I'm gonna contemporize it, everybody, everybody, has had to deal with and will deal with being rejected. If you were denied the job, that is rejection. If you were broken up with, that is rejection. If you were not picked for the squad, that's rejection. If you have ever gone through a divorce, even though maybe going through that divorce was your idea, you still made that call based on their lifestyle telling you that they do not want to live with you anymore. That is rejection. If your parents have ever gone through a divorce, and you were told hundreds of times that this has nothing to do with you but only to do with them, yet you still sat at a breakfast table with one of those parents no longer present. You still have felt the sting of rejection. Look at it with me on the side screen. Rejection is a refusal on the part of someone else to accept and appreciate you for who you are, and this is important too, and for who you are not. And it also means to throw you backwards. And that's exactly how the enemy wants to use it against you, to inhibit your advancement, to block your blessing, and to stop your progress, or to throw you backwards. Again on the side screen, rejection is a weapon that the enemy uses to wound the very soul of a person. 
And a soul wound is a very different kind of wound. A soul wound is one that does not bleed on the outside but bleeds internally. And it is not the cut, the superficial cut that will kill you. It is the affection that can kill you. People carry soul wounds around where all of a sudden they look great on the outside, but they're actually dying on the inside. And God gives a very specific critique to his leaders in the Old Testament, his pastors. He says to them, stop dealing with mortal wounds in my people superficially. Stop trying to put a Band-Aid on a potentially mortal wound. He said this in Jeremiah, they have treated my people's brokenness superficially. Stop playing with my people. They're broken and they're hurting and they've had their heart crushed and they're going through all kinds of things. Don't be teaching them a little silly stuff that doesn't matter. Get into their world and help those that are hurting on a deeper, on a deeper level. Well, we see this example of this, of rejection taking place in 1 Samuel. We see that he goes to Jesse's house, Samuel does, and he tells Jesse, there is a king in here. There's a king in here and you don't even know it. There's greatness in here and you can't see it. There is royalty walking all up and down in here and you act like you don't even have a clue that it's there. I think some of you can relate to this because regardless of what your past has happened to you, what's happened in your past, sometimes the people that you know or who that know you the best tend to value you the least. But just because somebody sees you a lot doesn't mean they see you right. David comes into the house, finds out what's going on. He's here to pick a king. And daddy, you couldn't even call me from the field. It had to be Samuel's idea. You didn't even think about me when you knew where I was. You didn't think I was important enough to at least make the parade even though I wouldn't have been chosen maybe. You wouldn't even call me in to be a part of it. Daddy, I don't care what Samuel thinks. I don't know Samuel. I care what you think. And you didn't think enough about me to Bring me in. You see, rejection hurts the worst when it comes from people that we value the most. But right there in front of all of David's brothers and his dad, Samuel breaks open a jar. He pours oil on David's head as a sign of him being the next king of Israel after Saul. So here he is oily and still injured because your oil, your anointing is not your healing. You being anointed, listen, being set apart by God to be used for God in a great way is not your healing from God. It is two extremely different things. And if you don't understand this, then all of a sudden you will not understand how some people can be so anointed. They can be so gifted. They can be so used in a powerful way and at the same time themselves be still dysfunctional and be struggling and be wounded and be hurt. You see, what I know is that the best ministers inside this room are those of you that are in pain right now and those of you who have been hurt and you're heartbroken in a great way. Because if I've got something going on in my life and I need to sit down and talk to somebody and if I sit down and talk to you and I start talking to you about what's going on and you can't relate to me, then all I'm doing is educating you. You're not helping me. But if I can sit down with somebody whose heart has been crushed, whose life has been betrayed, who's a promise has been broken to. If I can sit down with one of you that is going through hurt and has been through hurt and you're on the other side of it just a little bit and I can share with you and then you share back with me that things are gonna be okay because you've been there, you felt that, you know what I'm going through. You're the best minister in the room. Even so, you're still dysfunctional. Even though you're still struggling and even though you're still feeling pain. Dave is anointed. He's moved from where he was to a new position, but he still had the same old condition. He's still hurt. He's elevated, but he's still dysfunctional. The pain, the infection is still there in his life. He is put in a place where Saul says, I need a, you to be my armor bearer and I need you to play music for me. So he does that. And he, the Bible says Saul loves David dearly, but then he he also finds David to be a problem. And so you see this infection watch in David's life start to manifest itself a little bit later on. Take a look, 1 Samuel chapter 18. Saul thought, I'll pin David to the wall. And he threw a spear at David how many times? Come on, talk to me. Twice. But David dodged and got away how many times? Both times. Okay, see, see now I love David. David is a man's man. David was a worshiper. 
David knew that time with God meant victory. David knew that if I just spend one moment in the presence of God, that will overwhelm a lifetime of me striving without him. And so he worshiped God boldly. He loved him very, very much. He, didn't, he danced before people. He didn't care what people think. He was a worshiper of his almighty God. And he also was a warrior. He took out a lion and a bear with his bare hands. I mean, this is a, this is a man's man. I can relate to him on those levels, but I cannot relate to him in this verse. And it has to do with one little word. You know what that word is? Twice. Twice. You don't get twice with me. You get once with me. If I'm trying to help you and you throw a spear at me to try to kill me, I'm no longer in the room with you. I no longer need to help you. But David stayed in a room where there was abuse going on. Watch this. Because Jesse, because Saul gave David something that his own daddy didn't. And he was willing to be a part of the abuse and subject himself to the abuse because he didn't want to live without Saul's love. Later on in David's life, his own son is coming after him. He's about to lose his kingdom. Everything's difficult, everything's bad. He tells his generals, back off of these people, don't touch them. And the generals are trying to tell him, but these are your enemies, they're coming against you. And, and David said, no, leave them alone, because he had what we call, what we call selective conflict avoidance. Willing to take out Goliath, but also willing to let certain people around him that would easily kill him and destroy and take away everything he had because he did not want to live without their approval. Joab on one occasion came to him, a general, and said, David, what's going on with you, man? What's going on with you? He said, you treat people that love you as though they hate you. You treat people that hate you as though they love you. You, you treat people the worst that treat you the best. What, what's happening? These people can't stay in your life. But the selective conflict avoidance manifested from an infection that took place in his life way back in the day from being rejected. Because David never learned what you and I have to learn. The rejection says more about them than it does about me. I mean, I, listen, if you can do without me, then I consider that your loss, not mine. That's what a healthier person would say. Rejection says more about you than it does about me. He never learned also that rejection can be a result of people's vision and not your value. They're the ones that's messed up on that. They're the ones that's got it wrong. This is one major reason why so many people, wounded people, are living on a hamster wheel life for so long because sometimes they're waiting on the person who hurt them to come back and be a part of their healing process. And if we, we cannot wait on people hoping that they're going to come to their senses, hoping that they're going to finally say, I saw you wrong. I imagined that wrong. I shouldn't have said what I said about you. I got that whole thing wrong. Because if you're waiting on them, look at this on the side screen. When we are waiting on those who hurt us to be a part of our healing, then we are holding our own healing hostage for somebody else's growth. And you don't have time for that. You don't have time for that. You have to heal without their apology coming your way. And then finally, take a look at this one. This is good. Rejection can be a result of your success exposing their failure. You see, sometimes there's nothing wrong with you at all except the fact that you have been used as a mirror for them to be able to see what did not happen to them. I believe with all my heart that God wants you to live the greatest life you could possibly live. And I believe with all my heart that there are sometimes going to be things that are minor, really don't matter, that we just need to click off of. But there are going to be some things that are major that we can't play around with that have caused deep infections in the very soul of a woman that has caused her to build and put up a wall in front of her own heart that it might never happen to her again. And I believe there are rejections and infections that have happened in the life of men in this room where you're busy, extremely busy, in a hamster wheel of activity 
that you have not gotten to where you know God wants you to be today? The cause of infection that took place from rejection. And I believe with all my heart that God wants you out of that wheel and he wants you spending the rest of your life living it abundantly, living it blessed, living it joy-filled. And you cannot wait on anyone else to make that happen for you, but you. So today is your setting free day. Today is your jumping off the wheel day. And it's going to begin with a confession that you will make out loud to the very soul where the wound is. So if you trust me, and I hope you do, I want to ask you to repeat this after me right out loud, okay? So here we go. I am not perfect, but I'm enough. Yes, you are. Father God, we love you with all of our heart. Can't believe you love us as much as you do. You know us better than anyone has ever known us, and yet you don't want to just do lunch with us. You want to do all eternity. And we're so thankful for that. For the people in this room that have been broken, that have been wounded, and have been stuck, they're free today. In the powerful name of Jesus over their life, they are free. No more hamster wheel living. But live in the kind of blessed, abundant, happy, joy-filled, confident life that you want us to live. And I pray this over them in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Well, I love y'all. It's been fun. Have a super blessed day. I'm now going to take my purse and go back to Colorado where it is 59 degrees. Thank you very much. <laughs>